Um, it's my great pleasure and, and honor to uh, have the opportunity to introduce truly one of the giants in uh, aeronautics in the past 100 years. There's not a person in this room who doesn't know all about Dr. Wilkins' accomplishments. Um, just briefly, he and correct me if I make a mistake here, but all right. uh, he correct that he graduated from uh, Worcester Polytechnic in 1943 and came right to Langley, worked in the Transonic Aerodynamics branch, I believe, for your entire career. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, there was yeah, it was in the branch, but there were two different wind tunnels involved. All right. So yeah. in that particular branch, retired in 1980 after 37 years of working here. Um, we all know Dr. Wickham uh, discovered the concept of area ruling. Uh, he was awarded the Collier Trophy in 1954 for that. Um, also invented the um, application of supercritical wings to uh, aircraft and winglets and was awarded numerous awards and prizes for those um, substantial contributions to our craft. Um, truly, we are fortunate, all of us in this room, standing on the shoulders of giants like Dr. Whitcomb. So without taking any more of his time, I'd like to, um, like to all extend a warm welcome to Dr. Richard Whitcomb. stand for this. Uh, <clears throat> well, when I first went to work at Langley, uh, back, this was during World War II, and uh, at that point we were beginning to get some of, see some of the problems involved with transonic aerodynamics. In particular, most of those problems were due to shock, onset of shock waves. And I'm going to get very basic. A shock wave is a very sudden increase in pressure that is, results from the air slowing down at transonic and supersonic speeds. It, uh, it's the thing that you hear when you hear a sonic boom. There's an awful lot of energy loss in a shock wave, which then results in drag. And of course, it also greatly disturbs the flow around the models or around airplanes so that it makes the airplanes very unstable at times. It was the problem of these, as we went left through airplanes of World War II and started going to jets, then the problems really got severe because the jets were going at faster speeds, the, dry, the shock waves got stronger, and everything, well, <laughs> we had a, our tunnel to make tests on the things. But the British didn't have any wind tunnels at these speeds. And so they were decided that they'd go out and fly airplanes in these speeds. And they killed one pilot after another because the airplanes went out of control. It, the, the, this speed range is called the sonic barrier, that nobody could ever get through it. It was going to be so bad. Now, that's ridiculous. Bullets go through the speed of sound all the time. Uh, so uh, anyway. We faced up to it, and we were. And when I walk, walked in there, they were testing uh, propeller-driven airplanes in dives. The P-38, had a, which was a World War II airplane, had terrible problems when it got into a dive. And we, the people at, at the group where I was, uh, had just joined, came up with a solution for that. I had nothing to do with it. I was just a young uh, helper at that point. Uh, but uh, so uh, this was the start of this whole problem of transonic flow due to the problems due to shock waves. <coughs> now, here at Langley, John Stack and at uh, the Air Force, they decided that what they wanted to do is to fly not like the British did, but this time they're going to do it carefully. They were going to build an airplane that could fly through the speed of sound, the X-1. And uh, Chuck Yeager, of course, did that flying and uh, became very famous for it because there were people, remember, this was the old wives' tale was that you were going to get creamed when you went through the speed of sound because the British had gotten creamed. Uh, well, anyway, he went through the speed of sound very nicely. But his airplane was a rocket-propelled uh, well, airplane. It was. It used up fuel at a fantastic rate. He could only fly five minutes at that speed, and he was out of fuel. It was not the way to go. It was a brute force approach to flying through the speed of sound. We couldn't have 
military airplanes with that amount of power. They just burn. They wouldn't have any range. So uh, that was the start of the whole idea. Of everything going through the speed of sound, though. Now, the uh, in order to get through the speed of sound, we had to have something to cut way down on that drag due to the shock waves. The first uh, idea that was used, well, one of the first ideas, is to make a wing much thinner. That's a straightforward approach because then the air doesn't have to speed up as much around the airfoil and it, it doesn't, the shock waves don't get as strong. But uh, there's another thing that came along. The Germans, uh, particularly Bussmann, had invented sweepback back in 1934. Uh, Sweepback is a very powerful tool in delaying the onset of these shock waves on an airplane. And so uh, at the end of World War II, along with a jet engine, the British, I mean the Germans were starting to build airplanes with swept back wings. So uh, anyway, that uh, is just uh, the development. Now we had the thinner wings, the sweepback, and putting them all together in another airplane would probably greatly reduce this uh, problem of the shockwaves. And so uh, some of the first airplanes that we built, after World War II, we went into Germany and uh, we uh, went through all the papers and so forth that they had to see what they had knew they had that, uh, was <coughs> the, uh, that would help on our, our airplanes. And that's where they found out how, what the Germans were doing with wing sweep back. And they came back to this country and immediately airplane, many airplanes that we were, built, were getting ready to build were in, changed to put sweep back in the wings. We already knew we could improve things with thinner wings. So uh, we, we had uh, various uh, tools or means of reducing the drag. At about that same time after World War II, the, uh, the Pratt & Whitney Company developed the J57 <laughs> engine, a very, very powerful jet engine, much more powerful than anything that had come before. And so the military decided, the Air Force decided that they, what they could do was to build a, start building supersonic military airplanes with a, the new jet engine and with these various ideas that had come up to uh, reduce drag. But uh, they, they, there was a problem. We didn't have any means for accurately measuring what the data was, the, what was going on. So uh, we, at, at, the, at the group that I worked at, the transonic, it wasn't called transonic, it was called speed, high speed tunnel section. The, uh, we had to have a way of studying the flow about these configurations to see what we could do. And we, uh, we at the group developed the transonic wind tunnel. Uh, now, let's see, could I have the first slide, please? Now, the way that we do, uh, got transonic speeds in the tunnel was to, we called it ventilating. We put slots in the tunnel walls. Uh, I was involved with this. I was not the basic inventor of the idea, but I worked on trying to <laughs> reduce the power required. And this is a sting-mounted model in the middle of the tunnel. And uh, that is the first, what we call, transonic tunnel. And we got data through the speed of sound. A very, very important development because up to that point we didn't have a lot of good data on this problem. Now, with that, we could have the next slide, please. I mentioned something about the shock waves. And one of the tools that we had in that new tunnel was Schlieren. A Schlieren system is something that makes shock waves visible. You can see all the shock waves produced by this thing. This is at a supersonic speed because that's where the pictures are the best. Uh, when we, uh, <laughs> I think it gets complicated, but 
the, tunnel, the Schlieren system for the tran tranix, transonic tunnel was not very good. Uh, it wasn't that it was the Schlieren was wrong, it was just that it was too small for the extent of the shockwaves. Anyway, so we, this is something in a higher Mach number. This is about Mach number 1.4. That is 40% higher than the speed of sound. But I, wa I want this picture to show you how we could see the shock waves with the Schlieren system. Now, that's one of the things we used. We, we wanted to go into the new tunnel and study what the devil is going on. Because the uh, first test we ran on uh, the uh, military airplanes indicated that the drags were much higher than what they'd expected. Something bad was going on. And so, uh, can I have the next slide, please? I studied a, a meta study of a, the uh, flow around the representative airplanes, and uh, I came up with, and we uh, used the Schlieren system I just described. And here is a picture of a uh, swept back wing on a fuselage, and that's a plant side view. And this is a well, wait a minute, plan view, pardon me. And this is a side view. And don't go, that's a scratch across there. <laughs> now, the uh, interesting thing is that instead of having a strong shock wave here along the wing, there's a very strong normal shock wave here. This is a very weak wave. And uh, this is the side view, and it shows that. The, 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 this, this wave doesn't even show up in that side view. Only the very strong normal wave. And I looked at it and I said, my God, that looks about like a shock pattern on a, a shock on a body of revolution and, uh, without the, uh, uh, all the uh, detailed effects of the swept bang wing. So there was the, the clues. Uh, I sat and thought about it, and I, Boosman, who uh, had, uh, well, well, I'm getting ahead of myself on that, but anyway, the, uh, <coughs> so I, Boosman, well, I guess I better bring him in right now. Boosman had uh, come to this country. I want to sidetrack here a little bit, that uh, back, <laughs> back in the old times, when you won a war, you took the beautiful women and all their riches. These days, when you win a war, you take all their scientists and engineers. <laughs> <laughs> and the most important, uh, the one, the most public uh, is of uh, was Von Braun. <laughs> he was a willing prisoner. In fact, he was going to be in the, uh, the, the Pinamundi was going to be in the Russian area, and he took all his missiles and all his equipment and all his people and moved into the American territory. So he's a very willing prisoner. Uh, and he was a very, very important part of my, when we started developing the space program. But anyway, we also got aerodynamicists. And one of them was Adolf Boosman, who came to Langley Research Center. There was a very, very important prize. And again, he came willingly because uh, he thought well, there was not going to be any aerodynamics in Germany anymore. So uh, he was assigned to the same the tunnel that I, the group I was with. And so uh, it was a very, very interesting time. I might as a mention as a side issue, Tony Ferry, who was an Italian, came here too. He had been uh, part of the partisans, they call them. They were people who were fighting the Italian government. And we got him through devious ways, like bring him into church, Canada. This was during the war. He, he, there was, uh, remember, the, the Italians got out of the war early. And so they, we got him, brought him through Canada, because otherwise he would have put him, been in jail because he was an enemy alien. Anyway, we, so we had two uh, Axis scientists working at the group that I was at, because we didn't have any supersonic facilities at that point, even though 
uh, Tony Ferry was a specialist in supersonics. But we had the highest speed tunnels at that point, at a tunnel, anyway. Anyway, so here we had these two brilliant uh, uh, foreign scientists working right there. And uh, so uh, it was a very, very interesting time frame. <laughs> well, anyway, so here was the picture. And Boosman had given a lecture. Uh, he finally gotten to the point where he could speak reasonably good English. This was after the war now. And so uh, he gave a lecture on the nature, the nature of transonic flow, a fascinating discussion. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to get into the details of what he said, because then it will get totally complicated. But anyway, uh, he gave me a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, now, along with those ideas he gave me, I had this picture. And I put them all together, and it was just like a comic book or a, a comic page. A light bulb lit up over top of me. The, uh, aha, I know what it is. That the, let's have the next slide, please. I proposed at that point that the uh, shock wave strength and therefore the drag of airplanes near the speed of sound was a function of the longitudinal, that is along the length, development of the cross-sectional areas. In other words, here's a wing-body combination. And then in this case, the, uh, we've taken the, all the cross-sectional area of the wing and put it around the body. And you get a bump on the body. And uh, the drag now should be a function of that bumpy body and not the streamlined body. So I dug out all the information I could on various configurations being tested at the, uh, in various facilities. And it all seemed to fit. So I got up in a lecture at the, we, once a month we used to have these lectures on various aspects of aerodynamics. As I say, I, Bruce Mann gave one. Well, I got up and gave uh, one in which I proposed this idea. And of course, that was world shaking. And so, I said, well I, well, I called it a rule of thumb, because I didn't want to get uppity and say it was a basic theory. Boosman stood up and <coughs> said, many people come up with crackpot ideas and call it a theory. Whitcomb comes up with a brilliant idea and calls it a rule of thumb. <laughs> well, I, was, uh, I was in. Boosman had spoken. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Now, that is introducing the idea of the area rule. Now, the way you use the area rule is to, uh, that I, I proposed at that point, of course, uh, was to indent the fuselage where the wing is so that they're, to get rid of that bump in the area at that point, and therefore the drag was, uh, of wings should be cut down. And so I ran some basic tests on wing body combinations. And Lo and behold, if you indent the fuselage with the cross-sectional, uh, taking out the cross-sectional area of the wing, the wing drag, shock wave drag disappears. Fantastic, because now we have a way to get rid of some of the problems we had at transonic speeds. Well, the administrator of NASA came down to see me and I gave the talk. And he immediately clamped a top secret uh, on uh, the, uh, my idea. And uh, they wrote letters to all of the various manufacturers of transonic uh, airplanes, military airplanes, and said, you've got to come and see what you, he's got. They wouldn't dare send out a report, because it, they didn't want a report floating around that some spy might find. Because remember, we were not now in head-to-head -head combat with the Russians. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, they came in. And uh, so the first airplane that was going to be uh, used this was a F-102. We had tested the F-102 in this new transonic tunnel. And the drag for that thing was way higher than what they had 
prediction. And so I pointed out what their problem was. I showed them the bumpy body that it had and that they could reduce that drag by indenting the fuse line. So they went back and uh, designed an airplane, a, a modification of the F-102 with an indented fuse line. Now, we tested that and the drag came, we had cut the drag down to where they could go through the speed of sound. But uh, the F-102 is the one example we have where we have a flight demonstration of the effect because they'd already built the original one and they made a modification of the fuse life to get indentation. It, because of the engine problem and so forth, they couldn't cut it as much as they should, but they got cut it quite a bit. And so we tested that and the drag was down to where it was possible to go through the speed of sound. So we had, then they flew that airplane and it, uh, the drag was down enough so they could go through. <laughs> Now, that, uh, well, here was a case, a flight test that proved that this idea was working, not just a wind tunnel test. There are many, many people that don't believe wind tunnel data because if it disagrees with what they predicted, then the wind tunnel data is wrong, uh, particularly at transonic speeds where the tunnel was new and people were not familiar with all the, the, what the results would be. But anyway, it went through and so, this is the picture. There is the original F-102, a barrel fuse life. Here is the F-102A. You can all see the indentation in there. But as I say, it was not enough to totally eliminate the shockwave drag of the wing. Now here, the F-106 was a follow-on. And here they started from scratch so that they could indent as much as they needed. And you can see the huge indentation right there, much greater than here. And that one had a, got real, practically got rid of the wave drag of the wing. Anyway, here was a demonstration in flight of the area room. So, let's see. Oh, okay, okay let me say something about it. Well, immediately, uh, all of the airplanes that were, there were uh, more than half, most of the airplanes that were being intended for flight, uh, trans flight through the speed of sound to supersonic speeds had drags that were higher than they uh, had hoped. And so a whole group of airplanes were redesigned with new shapes of the fuse life. And, uh, but they didn't have a before and after that case. In those cases, it was airplanes that were still in the drawing, uh, the design stages, so they didn't have to rebuild the fuse life. They just put it in. And there were a number of cases. The B-58 is a supersonic bomber. It had the worst problem and far and away the greatest drag reduction when they used the area rule. They cut the wave drag in half for that airplane. Uh, now, let's see. Okay, that about does that on that. Uh, could I have a, okay, that's the story on the uh, area rule. Now, after the area rule was developed, and shortly after that, after we, it, was, it took a number of years to apply it to all the airplanes, uh, we, the space age developed. As you may know, uh, you probably remember, that the uh, Russians sent up Sputnik, and immediately there was a tremendous push to get into the space program. And NASA, or NACA, National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, <laughs> became the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. <laughs> John Stack, who was my boss at that time, said, we started sucking the hind tip, tit, uh, <laughs> because nobody was interested in aeronautics anymore. So uh, we, uh, Stack and my, some, some others stayed with aeronautics. But most of the people at the lab moved into the space program. And so we were uh, the uh, only, we were ha holdouts. But I wanted to stick with aeronautics, aerodynamics. <laughs> now, the first thing we did 
was to uh, stack to say what we, we we had to have a mission for us aerodynamics, and so it was decided decided to develop a supersonic transport, and the uh, uh, the laboratory developed uh, various teams developed various configurations for a supersonic transport. And we turned the, uh, we got the wind tunnel data, and we turned the data over to the several aircraft manufacturers. Uh, Boeing was one, General Dynamics was another, and Lockheed was another. And uh, they uh, designed supersonic transports based on the data that we'd gotten at supersonic speeds. Conclusion? All of them, including the one I designed, had direct operating costs way higher than uh, for subsonic airplanes. And that was in the days where we didn't, where the, the subsonic airplanes were not anywhere near as fully developed as they are now. So I said, this is for the birds. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, de we're proposing that we develop an airplane for the elite. And the second part was that Congress passed a law that said that supersonic transports could not be flown over land because it causes a boom, a sonic boom, that disturbs people over the entire path of the airplane. They had to be only flown over the Atlantic. And so uh, at that particular point, uh, the, uh, the FAA went ahead and pushed ahead trying to develop it. The head of the FAA at that point said that if British and French have one, we're going to have a supersonic transport. Well, finally, the, uh, the whole problem sunk in, and Congress canceled the money for the supersonic transport. It's one of the best things that Congress ever did in the field of aeronautics, because it was going to be a lemon, just like the Concorde was a lemon. As you probably know, they just stopped flying Concords after pouring billions of dollars into that thing. The, uh, the price, uh, the, 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 it was so inefficient that uh, the uh, <laughs> uh, people, well, anyway, what the, the British and French did first, uh, they wrote off all the development costs all the production costs of the 12 airplanes that they built, I think it was 12. And then they still had to charge $10,000 per flight to go across the Atlantic. It was absurd. And only the, uh, what are you called, beautiful people and uh, very, very rich businessmen could afford to fly across. But all the <laughs> movie stars, that was the way they made, showed their how important they were. Anyway, they finally gave it up, thank God, and then British are not intending to ever do it again. The French, of course, or, not, or the French either. The Russians along the way tried, and they, their airplane uh, crashed, and so they just got out of it too. Everybody now is out of the super tran tran sonic transport business. Recently, I, I had nothing to do with it, but they again poured a billion NASA poured a billion bucks into to try and get a supersonic trans transport again. And uh, they gave the contract to Boeing, and Boeing finally told them it's still not practical. And Boeing, will, the only company we've got left to build transports, said we don't want to build it. So that's where the supersonic transport stands. Uh, the area rule is great, but remember, it doesn't get all rid of all the drag, only the wing drag. It's still got a fuselage and a whole tail and that sort of thing. I think that the supersonic transport has died. Now, another interesting thing, I've never heard anybody say this, that their target is moving subsonic transports, particularly the, the ones Boeing transports and the British French tra subsonic transports, are much, much more efficient than uh, the subsonic transports were in the uh, days when they were trying to sell a supersonic transport. The target for the SSTs 
has moved. We have much better subsonic airplanes. So anyway, that's, I wanted to get that out of the way. I, I, as I say, I got out of that field long, many, many years ago, but I keep preaching. There's no reason to have a supersonic transport. Okay, now let's, I, got, I said, I'm gonna get out of this thing, the supersonic, and go back to subsonic. Now, at subsonic, high subsonic speeds, the, uh, before we get to the speed of sound and those strong shock waves, the initial, at about three quarters of the speed of sound, uh, a small shock wave develops over the upper surface of the wing. And uh, it's not a, this is not a very good picture of this, but it causes a separation of the boundary layer here and that plus the shock loss and the loss in the boundary layer here start an increase in drag. Not anywhere near as high as it is at transonic speeds, but enough to not allow flights above about three quarters of the speed of sound at that at time. So I said, what can I do to design, get, improve things at high subsonic speeds, not supersonic speeds? So, again, using all the equipment that we had for certain, uh, measuring the flow, shock, uh, Schlieren pictures, pressure distribution, and uh, wake surveys, I studied the flow on airplanes at these lower speeds and came up with a new approach to uh, airfoils at subsonic, high subsonic speeds. Now, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, at this particular point, the, uh, we had a new tunnel. The, uh, <laughs> this is the eight-foot transonic pressure tunnel. In the old days, we used to use small two-dimensional tunnels to develop airfoils. But along the way, along with the overwhelming uh, publicity that we were going to go, so we we're going to the place program, they closed down all the tunnels that tested airfoils. So I had to use the eight, new eight-foot pressure tunnel to use test airfoils. It was a far, far more expensive way to do it, but it's all we had. And I wanted to develop a good, new, high-speed airfoil. So at this particular point, I was head of the ranch and I could do it. Uh, uh, so, uh, all right, next slide, please. Here's what we did, as I say. Uh, it was not the efficient way to do it. We should have used a, a smaller wind tunnel, but this is the airfoil model in the eight-foot tunnel, transonic pressure tunnel. And so here's the airfoil right here. And uh, notice the slots, leading edge. We can change the angles at the end. We measured the drag by uh, measuring the wake loss at the back end. And uh, so that is what we use. And uh, <laughs> next slide, please. We came up with this series of airfoils. The first one. I'd look at the top one up there. I thought, well, if we could uh, delay the separation. Remember, a shock wave on the upper surface causes separation at the trailing edge. I said, why not put a slot in the airfoil, just like they do it uh, when an airplane lands or takes off. The whole back end moves back to put a slot between the wing and the, and the, the uh, <coughs> Flaps. I'm sure that all of you know that about that. I remember one time I was sitting next to some woman, and the uh, airplane started was getting ready to land, and so she flats came up and down, and someone says, "The airplane's breaking up." <laughs> I said, "No, that's supposed to do that." Anyway, so they, the opening up a slot is a big help in controlling the separation on the back end of the airfoil. And I said, "Well, if they do it." High, high, well, at uh, landing and takeoff, 
let's try it for transonic speech and so but when we did that immediately the uh, we first tried it with just a slot in a conventional airflow and it had a tremendous effect on delaying the onset of the separation i said but now the shock where the shock wave got stronger and moved all the way back here and so we started getting much more shock drag and not separation drag so what i did was to flatten off the upper surface to reduce the shock losses. And uh, that was what we first arrived at. Uh, at that particular point, I, I, I talked to many people in the industry about this, and one of the problems they face is that that, because it is transonic flow, that has to be a very accurate slot, much more accurate than the subsonic slot, because it's transonic flow. So I said, well, let's see what we can do about getting rid of that. And so what I did was to design the whole airfoil, so right in, in particular this region, so that we got rid of the separation on the upper surface by the uh, proper shaping in here. That we got in 19, we developed in 1967. However, nobody liked this thin trailing edge. So I said, okay, we'll thicken up the trailing edge. All kinds of, that, people say, you don't do that sort of thing. I said, you do on this airplane because of, because of the, uh, uh, because of the design of the shape. This has very little effect on the drag. The, uh, we get the lift by this thing on the lower surface and this, allows the trailing edge allows to tilt the whole lower surface down just like a flap and it greatly increases the lift with relatively low drag that's the way we finally arrived at a airflow uh, i don't want to go through all the pressure divisions and so forth but that was the super critical airflow that is now being used on a number of airplanes incidentally i want them on this the uh, Boeing company has a very, very strong NIH factor, not invented here. <laughs> now, but more recently, uh, because they're having head-to-head -head combat with the uh, British and French on the, the, uh, their airplane, they're broken down. Now, they are now using an airfoil that looks very much like this one. Uh, they were testing their latest model airplane, model of their air, air, airplane, in our the transonic, the new transonic tunnel, the transonic, you know, the national transonic facility. And so I, I was invited to take a look at their model, and I looked at it, and sure enough, their air force looks exactly <laughs> like that. <laughs> they had to because they were. The, the, the British and French had done it. They were using it. And Boeing could just not compete without using that supercritical airfoil. OK. Now, uh, could I have the next slide, please? All right. <laughs> the airfoil was so uh, drastically different that nobody, this is back now, um, now nowadays, I, this is way, way earlier than now. Uh, so uh, the director of aeronautics said, we've got to flight di de demonstrate this new airfoil in flight with uh, real airplanes. So he proposed that we build a new wing for the F-8 fighter airplane. It was never intended to be retrofitted on the F-8 because this was going to be a subsonic airplane, subsonic airfoil, and the F-8 was a supersonic transport, a uh, supersonic fighter. However, it, the, the, the big advantage of the F-8 was that the, the wing pivoted here, and all you had to do was to pull the pin out of the pivot and take the wing off. Fantastic important because you didn't, 
there wasn't a whole structure that had to go through the airplane. It was all part one thing. So I, I designed a wing, a transport wing, that would go on the F-8. And it was built by North American, not the, the people that built what? Built the original F-8. But North American wanted to get into the advanced work, and so they put a, they, I'm sure they lost money on building it, but we didn't charge them. They, 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 they underbid what everybody else did, and they probably spent a lot of their own money. But anyway, we flew a transport wing the supercritical airfoil on the F-8. Now, there were two other things that uh, could be, the supercritical airfoil could be used on. Uh, first, the airfoil greatly improved the maneuverability of air, uh, the high lift, transonic high lift characteristics uh, up near uh, speed of sound. I think that well, it was about 40% increase in the maximal lift at high, transonic speeds. So uh, the Air Force said, well, we'll put up the money for a supercritical wing on the F-111, which uh, has supersonic capability, but flies uh, at subsonic speeds. Incidentally, most air fighter airplanes fly to their target uh, at subsonic speeds. Only when they get into combat do they go supersonic. So anyway. Uh, we uh, developed a new wing for the F-111 and flew it, and it greatly improved the maneuverability of that airplane. But there were, uh, nobody was going to put up money to retrofit those wings to the existing one F-111s. But it did prove in flight that we could greatly improve maneuverability. Now. A third thing you can do with the supercritical airfoil is to make the wing thicker. Now, why should you make a wing thicker? Well, the most important thing is that it, uh, you get more volume, obviously, but the more important thing is that you can improve the structure so that you can go to higher aspect ratios. And so on that, for that d development, we flight tested, or the Navy, flight tested a thick supercritical airfoil on a North American trainer. Could I have the next slide, please? Here it is, the Navy T2C. And now, I don't know if you can all see it, but this is the original wing, and this is the one with a thick supercritical wing. I can see, I think you can all see this much thicker than that. This was 12% thick, this was 17% thick. And uh, it uh, proved that uh, we got all of that gain in thickness, but with the same drag rise Mach number, same high speed characteristics. So we proved that one. <laughs> now, I think that's about enough for that. Now, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that uh, we also did during that period was to develop a theory to uh, predict what the characteristics of these new supercritical airfoils would be. Now, this was many, many years ago, remember, and so it was in the 1970s. And so uh, at that point, uh, we were just developing some of the theoretical things that were needed for these airfoils. I'd like to stop just a minute and point out that transonic flow is very, very complicated because it's a mixture of subsonic and supersonic flow. The whole upper, above the upper surface, we've got a bubble of supersonic flow. And you cannot use simple linear theory to calculate what the flow will be. It has to be non-linear theory. Anyway, we gave a large contract to the New York University uh, Applied Mathematics Group, billions of dollars, 
I still had 50 years, billions, uh, millions of dollars. So anyway, <coughs> they, um, <coughs> they did a number of things. Uh, but Tony Ferry, I'm not, pardon me, Tony Jameson, who was working with the people there, uh, did the development work on a theory to predict the characteristics of these airfoils. Now, keep in mind, it was a very complicated theory. And I put this slide up merely to uh, show you the kind of th the work you had to do. This is a grid that was used. Uh, because uh, you, you go around, I might point out, as I said, uh, you can't uh, straightforwardly arrive at an answer. It's all done by cut and try. That is, the, th the computer computes uh, each of the, the flow in each one of these little boxes and then starts uh, interfacing all the little boxes. And through iteration, they finally arrive at a solution. It's a, a very, very uh, tedious process. No human being could sit down in a lifetime and calculate that. But a computer, if it is nothing else, is fast. And so they, what you do is to put this grid into a computer and come up with a solution, a nonlinear solution, of a mixture of subsonic and supersonic flow. Very, very good theory. As I say, Tony Jameson may develop that theory. Uh, when we got the theory, uh, <laughs> uh, com we compared it with uh, wind tunnel da the flight da uh, wind tunnel data, and it hit right on the money. I mean, you couldn't have asked for a better agreement. It was within the accuracy of the wind tunnel data. Fantastically good theory. I immediately told people that they didn't have to trust test airfoils anymore. Just use the Jameson theory. And it was a very, very useful step forward. Nowadays, of course, well, Tony went on, uh, uh, was he at Princeton, he was at New York University at that point. Then he moved, moved to Princeton. He's now at Stanford. But he, what he did next was even far, far more important. He developed a three-dimensional theory, which is far more complicated than this two-dimensional theory. He's still at Stanford, and as I understand it, still working away. <coughs> now, that is, I wanted to mention that now theory has uh, gotten to a point where you don't have to run wind tunnel tests, on, at least on airfoils. Next slide, please. Now, I'm going to switch subjects, and let me get a drink here first. <laughs> this is, we had a, in order to work on the problem of uh, trailing vortices about uh, the uh, my, some of you may not hear have heard that uh, there are very, very strong vortices off the tips of wings because the positive pressure on the lower surface and the negative pressure on the upper surface can scoot around the end and cause a swirling in the flow like that. So this is, uh, this is the one side, uh, this is one side and this is the other side of the wing. Now, that is, any airplane flying has that problem. At low speeds, at landing and takeoff, the wing is flying at a very high lift coefficient, and therefore these vortices are very strong. Back uh, oh, 20 or 30 years ago, when they first, uh, when things were getting very interesting, the uh, small airplanes landing behind transport airplanes would be flipped right over if they got into one of these vortices. They had to increase the spacing between big airplanes and small airplanes, which of course greatly delayed the, or reduced the number of airplanes that could land in a given time frame. So Langley, at that point, worked with methods for reducing that, these vortices. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. 
I want to talk about uh, a means for reducing the vortices at cruise conditions, particularly at high-speed cruise conditions. <laughs> now, what I propose, next slide, please. And here's what I came up with. The, uh, this is a typical transport airplane. It's a KC-135. And what I did was to put a, right at the vertical thing here, and this is a detail of the thing, it's a little wing. It is not an end plane. Way, way back um, at the turn of the century, before the Wright brothers flew, Lancaster, in a book that he brought out, uh, proposed that you put end plates at the tips of the wing to reduce the, the flow around the tip. Now, over the years, many, many people tried to achieve the results that Lancaster proposed. But they, when they tested these things, they never got, they never got anything practical. Because somewhere along the way, whether it was Lancaster or said, you put plates at the end of the wings. I mean, we're talking nomenclature now. You do not put plates at the ends of wings because they're not efficient devices. So what I said was, what you do is to put a little wing out at the end because then it's going to be just as efficient as the wing itself because it's a, just a plain wing. It's got camber, it's got uh, taper ratio, it's got uh, all the fun things that we learned over the years on designing good wings. That's why I call them winglets. And when you do, then you get a definite reduction in, in the vortex uh, and uh, it straightens out the flow. Remember, this is a lower winglet is turning the flow this way and in the upper winglet it turns it this way. And you've gotten rid of some of the vorticity and immediately you get a reduction in drag. Uh, now, what you, as I said, you have to design it with all the care that you do use on designing a wing. It is not an end plate. I've emphasized that over and over again. It's not a plate, it's a little wing. And what we did, we got a reduction in drag, which, uh, now, everybody has said, well, you can get the same effect by just extending the wing tip. You have to compare the structural problem with a wing tip. If you increase the tip, then the bending moments at the root of the wing are increased because you've got a greater span out there. But <coughs> with a winglet, you don't get that greater span. Notice that the flow, uh, I mean, the, the lift is pointing inward, not upward. And so when you do that, the, uh, <laughs> the bending moment is greatly reduced. And so what I found was that the only, uh, one configuration after another was that the drag reduction due to the winglet was twice as great as the winglet compared to the bending moments compared to the bending moments for a wing. Uh, that is, the, uh, the increase in bending moments was not anywhere near as great as it was for a wing tip. Therefore, you end up with a net gain compromise between uh, structure and aerodynamics. And so uh, the, uh, immediately, most of the business jet people started using these things. It was interesting. The, uh, but anyway, the uh, Bo Boeing company, we paid the Boeing company to test uh, winglets in a tunnel on the 747, and they came to the conclusion that it did help, so you've probably seen winglets on the 747. The Airbus has winglets on the tip. However, uh, Boeing, again, not invented here, didn't use winglets on many of their other airplanes, although they're starting to use the winglets on some of the other airplanes. Well, 
that about covers the various things that I've worked on. So I think that, let's see, what time have you got? It's about five minutes three. Would you, can you uh, entertain some questions? That's what I was going to do. Uh, let me sit down here. Okay. I wrote down some questions while you were speaking. Okay. Uh, you talked about the Germans and how helpful they were. That, how, how much ahead do you think that, that put us by getting the help from the Germans? Do you think we would have gotten there within five years, or you think that helped us five years or ten years, or, or how much? Well, keep in mind now, that's, this is my own personal opinion. And maybe many people disagree. Boosman was the greatest aerodynamicist in the world. And he was a German. So, uh, uh, anyway, they, you, you, we had to have him. It's just like uh, with Von Braun. If we were going to have a space program, we, hadn't, we needed Von Braun. Also, uh, there's another German, Schlichting, who I use his textbook over all speed ranges and studying turbulence and everything, but almost more than any other. Wait a minute, he was a Swiss. He was a Swiss. Swiss, okay, well, he, <laughs> they, they were neutral. <laughs> but, I didn't realize they were yeah. uh, the, uh, Keep in mind that, that Switzerland has three languages. German, uh, French, and what is the other one? Italian. Italian. Yeah, okay. And so, he was from the German part. He spoke German. We had a uh, guy that was gung ho on laminar flow. Uh, we got him at our laboratory, and he swore by Schlichting. Uh, and so he was a pretty interesting character. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, he, he wasn't anywhere near of stature as it, uh, Boosman was. Remember, Boosman invented the swept back wing. And the bi Boosman biplane? Oh, yeah, but that's impractical. But it's an interesting theory. Yeah. Get rid of this wave drag by uh, using a biplane. The problem might even be bigger than that. Without some of these people, it isn't that we were five or ten years behind. We just may never have done these things. Well, it's hard to say. Well, look, look how some of the programs <laughs> taking a dive. Yeah. I heard that uh, you were famous for having a file and going into a wind tunnel and filing on models and and uh, can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because that's yes. not how we do things today. <laughs> well, no, we've got a theory. Remember, I've already I mentioned in my talk. That theory was so good, you didn't have to build models and test them. That was just go to the theory and forget about all the filing that I did. But, but that was back before we had any theory. And so I, the, the Ames people are always, uh, maybe Ames people here. All <laughs> right. Uh, did you ever? Uh, run into Antonio Ferry? Oh, yes. I, didn't I mention him as we got him at the laboratory? So I more than ran into him. His desk was just a few from mine. Tony Ferry was an interesting, fantastically interesting person. Uh, as I, He was the, the air expert on supersonic air, aerodynamics. <coughs> and so we got not only uh, Boosman, who was essentially an expert on transonic aerodynamics, but Tony Ferry. Now, since we at the laboratory at that point knew nothing about supersonic aerodynamics, there weren't books on supersonic aerodynamics. Tony, we got Tony, and he wrote a book on supersonic aerodynamics, and it was published, and that became the Bible on supersonic aerodynamics. And uh, he had a class that he um, gave, and all, I'm sure all the aerodynamicists at Langley at that point took the class because it went on for year after year. Uh, but after he learned a little bit of English, <laughs> he just didn't 
go on and get good English. He was, uh, we never could tell we were talking about soup, uh, he called it soup sonic. Thing. And then he, he cut, cut the ER off of supersonics. So we had soup sonic and soup sonics. Nobody could ever tell which one he was talking about. <laughs> But he was a very interesting person. I dealt with him many times. And uh, he left and went to work Brooklyn Poly. And uh, up there, he was still doing things, but he was a prof professor and not a researcher anymore. Uh, I, I think they had some tunnels there, too. But uh, uh, we were sorry to see him go. Of course, Boosman finally left. He went to the University of Colorado. They get to a point where they want to get into academic uh, areas. And, and so well, with people like that, they like to be at universities. I'd rather be here. <laughs> universities are teaching what we learn. At least back in those days it was. I don't know what we learn these days. Uh, but <laughs> with uh, uh, us, well, hopefully, We'll still be doing aeronautical search at this laboratory. But when they put an astronaut in charge, I'm worried. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I'd like to follow up on that filing question. Back in those days, um, were you able to do a lot more as a researcher? You could, you, you could control things a lot more. You could go in there. and It seems like you were able just to go in there and do things. Uh, these days, the damn rules are so great, I could never do that. Uh, it was getting bad but before I left. Uh, I used to, when I had an idea, I'd make a sketch. And at this point, at particular point, I'd go over to the wood shop, but later, well, anyway, first it was a wood shop. And I'd give them a little sketch and I'd say, I don't want this. And the head of the wood shop was great. I mean. But this is particularly so in the case of the area rule. So anyway, he'd do what I suggested. Now, along the way somewhere, they said, we, you can't do that with little sketches. You've got to have an engineering drawing. So this, <laughs> this was after they, I developed the area rule. It was during the period when I was developing the supercritical wing. You have to have an engineering drawing. Second, they started doing everything under contract. And they wouldn't let me go to the contractor and see what was, go was going right or not. And so, uh, but anyway, we, uh, in our own machine shop, I was building models out of steel at this point, or uh, the, uh, uh, we had a machine that measured the uh, airfoil characteristics, the shapes of the wing very, very accurately. And so uh, when they said you've got to have this done by a contractor, I immediately, after I got the wing back from the kind of, we, we, we got it back in the laboratory, I put it in that machine. And it was never accurate enough because the contractor knew that I wanted the wing gun and he, that they would always be late in developing it, of course. And so that, by that time, I was pacing the floor what my mom. <laughs> and so I get it and it's not accurate. Is this whole problem of contract that it gets the it, Jesus it irritates me. Anyway, well, you lose control. Anyway, so yes. Uh, what do you see as uh, challenges in aeronautics today? And if you were back at the center now, what would you look at if you could look at anything you wanted? To? Oh boy, that I'm glad you. I wish you hadn't asked that question. <laughs> 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 the one thing I wouldn't do is work on an SST. <laughs> that is for the birds. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, there. I, I, the answer is I don't know. Uh, the uh, remember the, one of the things that uh, that I, 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 I'm not. I haven't for 20 years now. I haven't been paying attention what they're doing. What you all doing out here in aerodynamics. <laughs> Pardon? You haven't missed a whole lot. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I did, Boeing came in and was uh, giving a briefing. It was about a year ago or so. And what they were doing at that point 
was trying to make the supercritical airfoil better. They had now had a theory, they had theories, uh, good theories, uh, I guess better than what I had, or but what Tony Jameson developed. That, uh, but anyway, here they were putting fine tuning the supercritical airfoil. Now I'd gotten most of what you can get out of the supercritical airfoil many, many years ago. But they got to do something, so they are trying to polish my ideas. It looked like to me. Nobody's coming up anything else. People are reinvestigating the slot of wing concept. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Flight. Do you have any thoughts on the, the success of that, the, the viability of that? Well, the, what I let's let's get to into that. Originally, I had a slotted airfoil. Remember. Right. When I went to an unslotted airfoil, I lost some drag rise Mach number, about 02, compared to the tenth that I kept. Uh, so uh, you, if you can develop, if you can go back to the slot, you'd gain something, particularly on thick supercritical airfoils, because there the separations or problems are greater. And so maybe someday we'll have slotted airfoils. But as I told them when I heard what Boeing was doing, you have to, you can't make things so that you, everything is a thousandth of an inch accurate. That slot, because of the bendings, uh, deflections of the slot, you, you can't have perfect uh, slot. One of the reasons that I stopped working on a slot airfoil was that in talking to the manufacturer, they would give me some idea of what the problems would be just from aeroelastic deflections. And the airfoil, the slots could not be held accurately because of those aeroelastic deflections. Now they're going back and they're trying to smooth out everything even more. But the deflections are still there. I don't know whether that's going to work or not. I got, well, <laughs> the, the, the slotted airfoil, remember, one of the things that, that uh, you don't think about was that if you're on a real airplane, you got you got to hold the, the trailing piece on to the front piece, and you got to struts in there, right. and the struts have to be carefully designed too. It's a very tedious job. I guess there's also a desire to use the same trailing edge element for a high lift system. Yeah, I know. And it probably is. If you optimize it for one, it doesn't work very well for the other, I would, I would think. But well, yeah, but uh, it's an interesting approach that you could, could use it for both. Although I'm sure that the, what you really do is just use the supercritical part as an element of a uh, fl uh, flap system. Remember, there's on a, uh, many transports, there's more than just one right. slot. They got a whole series of them, as I think I mentioned in the talk. Woman thought the airplane was breaking up because all those pieces came out. I have another question. I don't, there you go. I don't want to call it a question. I wanted to comment about flow control that was done in the early days, with blowing suction and so forth, and because uh, there's a lot of research in that these days with active flow control, where you have pulse pulse blowing and synthetic jets and things like that. Yeah, you mean for high high lift? For high lift, or yeah. for separation control, yeah. or even maneuvering. Oh, okay. Well. One of the things that uh, interested me, back in those days, uh, they were talking about blowing and sucking to reduce the separation due to the shock wave. Remember I showed the, talk, I talked about that. And I got rid of the separation by the slot and then later on by proper contouring. Now, that, uh, one of the things that you got to realize was that everybody thought that the separation on the upper surface started at the shock wave, but it didn't. This is my basic uh, idea on the supercritical wing. If you look at the Schlieren pictures of a flow as it develops on the upper surface, it starts at the trailing edge and moves forward to the shock wave. It doesn't start at the shock wave. So when you're using su suction or blowing, you don't do it at the shock wave itself, you do it near the trailing edge, just like I did with the slot. I had a question for you about uh, area rule on today's 
and I'm thinking fighter airplanes. When you look at some airplanes, like the F-16, you can see the area ruling in there. But when I look at an airplane like the F-15, it looks like a big boxy fuselage. It's not obvious to me that there's much area ruling going on. Is, is, do you know if that's the case, or, or are they just using brute, brute force to get, get through those conditions? Well, that's a good, you used the term there. These days, remember, the area rule was important because <coughs> the thrust available at that point at transonic speeds wasn't good enough. Nowadays, they've got thrust coming out their ears <laughs> designed for <laughs> flying at maneuvering at supersonic speeds, and they go through the speed of sound climbing. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, the need for transonic area ruling has disappeared. I mean, it's just they've got the, all the power they need. However, uh, what I have done over the years and uh, worked with people on this, in most cases, I didn't write to do any basic research and write a report. I just talked with, when the industry people would come in with a problem, I'd tell them how to reshape the airplane on the basis of the area rule to get rid of these problems. There were always, but local problems. One of the biggest uh, problems that uh, business jet people have is the interference between the engine uh, on the, mounted on the back end of the fuselage and the fuselage. And uh, the float ha tries to get through there and uh, it uh, separates. Also, the flow around an engine to sell on a, underneath a transport wing has all kinds of interference problems. And so what I did over the years was to work with the industry to develop what I call local area ruling to re get rid of those problems. What I would do would sh shape the pylon in particular. Um, if you, well, these are things that people don't notice, but uh, on business jets, particularly the, the uh, oh God, uh, and, uh, Gulf No, no, the, uh, it's, uh, Okay, anyway, anyway, I worked with the people on this uh, Cessna. They have a high-speed uh, fighter uh, business jet, and I worked with them to get rid of the interference problems between the nacelle and the fuselage. They had some really whiz-bang problems there, and so what I did was to reshape the, uh, I call it the internal area rule, because you shape the thing on the basis of the area distributions through the channel. Is that fuselage shaping? Yeah, well, in, in, no, in this particular case, they reshaped the pylons. That was the... Pylons. Yeah, right. They were area, the area rule pylons. Probably the biggest interference that, uh, problem that ever existed was when uh, on the 990, GE had developed an engine in which all of the, the fan was rearward instead of up forward. Uh, and uh, so when they put that damn engine underneath the wing of the 990, the interference problems were out of this world because all of that cross-sectional area was under the wing. So uh, the guy from GE, they, they, they were going uh, to have problems. And GE, remember this is a GE engine. So he asked me what to do and I, told him what I thought. Well, anyway, he was out in the West Coast. Here I was in the East Coast. Every night after he run tests, he'd call me up and say, now what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, what I did was to work out shaping of the pylons so that the, the interference was greatly reduced. And that's the starting point of that. And then I did it for a lot of other airplanes. Hey, one more question following up on the, on the file. <laughs> Today, one of the problems we've seen, and I think, you know, at Leonard's uh, um, conference a few weeks ago, we touched upon it. One of the problems we have today in NASA is that all of our research is controlled by program office funding, and the researchers and the branch heads, for instance, like Dan, don't have the intellectual freedom that apparently you all had back in those days. Well, I told you that I wasn't having much intellectual freedom before I left. <laughs> <laughs> back in the 50s, Let's say in that era, was it someone like yourself or, or some other researcher who had an idea? Did you have the ability to to um, get funding to go to go pursue that idea, or, or how were you funded, for instance, on the area ruling? 
what was your was your where was where was the money coming from? Well, keep in mind that the, the, the models that I developed or used to, to prove the area rule were very very simple models. What I did at that point was remember I had an idea and I was hot to go. We used the exi an existing wind tunnel uh, balance. Are you familiar with balances? They the, the little electric devices that measure the, all the forces. And uh, I'm sure that they're, they're used around here these days, but and probably much better than what we had. But anyway, they, also, they had strain gauges on a beam that measured all the forces. So I had that, and so I used just a, just a, a pulled one off the shelf. And uh, it wasn't anywhere near what I would have wanted, but they, I was doing making do. Then, uh, I had a machine shop turn out a basic fuselage to go on that, and then the wood shop built all the inserts of the various area distributions that I wanted. And the wood shop, of course, making things out of wood is far, far easier than making them out of metal. And I was gung-ho, and I'd get an idea, and I'd go to the wood shop with my sketch and say, okay, this one, this is what I want next. So it's all paid for by the center? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It was all in-house research. See, we, we, we don't do much of that anymore. And that's a real shame because that, I think your, your development certainly or, or evidence that that was a good way to do it. Where you, you allowed people to have some freedom to go yeah. explore some of their ideas. There's, right. there's now a, a process where they're trying to completely get rid of the basic funding. And now anybody that wants to do something has to go out and find a partner or find a source of money get it funded through a proposal, then start doing the research. Like we're supposed well, to know the answers in advance and yeah. know the right questions to ask. Well. <laughs> kind of backwards. The more I hear, I wonder how you do anything. <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> Which is why you were saying there's no new stuff happening. That may be one of the reasons that well, no. you've got a lot of smart people, but it's hard to get through the process. Well. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a project where the process they're using probably makes a little bit of sense, but you don't do research that way. Yes. I've got another one for you on fighter airplanes. I asked you a minute ago about the area rule. What about the airfoils used on today's fighters? I know that the supercritical airfoils are widely used on transports. Yeah, but it's all subsonic. Fighters are mostly supersonic. And so. Uh, the F-111, for example, had, we tried a supercritical airfoil on that because it had, well, one of the things I already mentioned is that most airplanes, some fighter airplanes fly most of the time at subsonic speeds right. and then fight at supersonic speeds. But they go out to their targets and so forth at subsonic speeds. So you could say that there should be a need for a supercritical airfoil. But then it screws up to everything at supersonic speeds and remember, it's not intended for supersonic operations. And <laughs> right now it looks like, um, and this is uh, good probably, but it, uh, everything seems to be designed to make airplanes invisible to radar. And you've seen the pictures of these airplanes. They don't look like aerodynamicist airplanes anymore. <laughs> Yeah, G's got it. Uh, I just heard a couple stories. Um, did you have a cot that you used to keep in the wind? Oh, God. <laughs> All right. When I was gung ho on an idea, I didn't just come out eight, eight, eight hours a day and say, okay, now I'm going home. I'd stick with a member. I was on the job. I mean, uh, when I had a model in the tunnel, I wanted to remember the tunnel was on uh, two shift operation. Uh, we didn't, but the need for that tunnel was so great that it was always on two shifts. Because not only we did we, I have the use of the tunnel for my ideas, but we were supporting the military. We were doing a lot of tests of military airplanes. And of course, sometimes we test commercial airplanes as long as the commercial, the manufacturer would allow us to publish the data. And they would do that because it would, usually took us a long time to get the pub, data published. We just turn over a copy of the data to them, and then somebody sits down and works out all the fancy figures and so forth. So they recognized that they'd beat everybody else with the data. So we were doing that. 
But getting back to the cut, when you're working uh, on that uh, various, this is back in the days when I was shaping things to my, uh, even after we got a two-dimensional theory, I had to shape things for three-dimensional flow. This is before Tony Jameson came up with a three-dimensional theory. And so in later years, it was always uh, trying to reshape three-dimensional wings. And keep in mind, just as a theory is more complicated, I had to think about ideas in three dimensions instead of two dimensions. The theory does it for you, but I was doing it by uh, my intuition or whatever you want to call what I do. The, uh, so uh, I'm out there two shifts a day, and I got tired. <laughs> so I had a cut, and if I felt like I was lying down, after I'd reshaped the configuration and said, OK, test that, I'd go and lie down on the cot and go to sleep. So, I'll right. get you a cot, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> I also heard you hear, man, you lost a couple of coffee mugs. Well, it's a cop of... Oh, no, that's ridiculous. No, no, no. <laughs> Legends getting bigger. Well, I don't know where they got that one came from. I may have long the way somewhere dropped the mug, and of course, all kinds of stories. It, 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 well, then, anyway. Uh, no, I didn't drop mugs. <laughs> <laughs> what, were your, was that air rule and super cook wing, was that, it sounds like that was almost more of an intuition based on a broad base of background research as opposed to a methodical advance? Is that kind of? Well, no, no. The, as I mentioned uh, in my talk, the area rule was a pure case of inspiration. I mean, I, I put all the pieces together, and suddenly I had the idea. Developing the supercritical airflow was a step-by-step -step yeah. process of looking at, I, I remember, we, I wasn't doing, uh, uh, you know, it said that uh, if you put a bunch of chimpanzees down in front of typewriters, they'll come up with Shakespeare's sonnets if you give them enough time. And so it's a, what they call the cut and dry method. I was, this was, what I did was not cut and dry. I had a whole group of things. I had a Schlieren pictures, I had pressure distributions, I had wake surveys, and I'd look at all those things and say, okay, now what do I do next? Based on the, all the years I'd learned about what I'd learned about aerodynamics. And so it was part air, experimental and part intuitive. Uh, the anyway, the uh, getting it. We got into the three-dimensional case, and that was a very interesting area because it was far more complicated than uh, two-dimensional. We had a theory for two-dimensions. Uh, I'll give you an example. This is just one example of many, many. Somewhere along the way, somebody had the idea that we should sweep a wing forward with some guy up in Air Force. Uh, what we, anyway, they got a place over there where they do advanced thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says, let's have swept forward wings. Now, the Germans tried a swept forward wing during World War II. And there it was, a wing with the airplane with a swept forward wing. Do you see any other airplanes that were there? Well, the Air Force got enough money to give a contract to one of the manufacturers to develop or design and develop a swap forward wing. Now, at the time, uh, he, I, you know, I, I told him he, he had a swap forward wing, this guy, the model of it, and it wasn't anywhere near as good as a swap back wing. I said, well, I can, I'll fix it for you. So I went in on the usual intuitions and developed a, what worked with a file. And so this, this is one of these cases where you, you, I was doing my filing. You know, what I do is I, you put on plastic, and then you, I didn't file on steel. <laughs> <laughs> it was plastic surfaces. And I developed, I got rid of all these problems for swept forward wings. He says, but it's no better than a swept back wing. I said, I never promised that to you. I just make it as good as a swept back one. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Let's see, most transport aircraft today is sort of in the Mark 23.85 uh, 
true speed. Do you see that as being sort of a upper limit or just an optimization of propulsion characteristics to carry passengers? Okay, now that brings up, I, I didn't even bring this up because uh, it's it never, it, well, it didn't work. Along the way, after I had the area rule and the supercritical wing and uh, all the various things, I said, I'm going to design an airplane that flies at not supersonic speeds, but at the speed of sound, uh, as high as possible, a subsonic speed. And so I came up with a configuration with an indented fuselage, supercritical wing, that works. And we built a model of that and tested it. And sure enough, we got it up to Mach number 0.99. I didn't get to one, but anyway. So, at that particular point, NASA or Langley gave a con gave contracts to three manufacturers to design real airplanes around that that design, and there was a millions of dollars involved with it, this study. And so, everything uh, Boeing at that particular point was laying down a real transport airplane with that conf configuration. I thought that I had, that we were going to have a, up to the, what we call the sonic airplane. Couldn't call it supersonic. However, suddenly, the Arabs quadrupled the price of fuel. I don't know whether you all remember that or not, but suddenly, the airline industry wasn't the least bit interested in flying faster. They just wanted, say, they said, we need more efficiency because the cost of fuel is now driving us up the wall. So I said, okay, we'll use a supercritical airfoil to get uh, the uh, more efficiency. Now, I already mentioned that we tested a thick supercritical airfoil. So one of the ways that you use a supercritical airfoil is not to go faster but to use a thicker wing, which then allows you to go a higher aspect ratio, which then is more efficient, obviously. So uh, that was the approach I used. And we started building models with higher aspect ratios. Uh, and incidentally, you also want to reduce the sweep, because it's, well, I don't know. I, <laughs> here, here is a swept wing. Uh, here, looking at it, there's a swept back wing. If you move, turn it forward, the aspect ratio increases. You, if you go way, way high swoop, sweep, then the aspect ratio is way down. <laughs> R.T. Jones, who pushed swept back wings, told me, told me one time, what are you so worried about Air Force for? Just sweep the wing back. And I said, but then you lose aspect ratio. So uh, the... Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, that was the way that I thought we should go in trying to improve LRD. And so, sure enough, that's what happened. Most air wings these days, I don't need to look close enough to airplanes, the aspect ratios on these new wings are much higher than previous wings because they, can go, to a, they go to a thicker airfoil with less sweep. That's one big thing. That, uh, there's less sweep in all these new transports than there was in the KC-135, which was the first uh, good transport. And so you, 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 you get the aspect ratio by two different means. And that's the way they went. But there are super, they are super critical. As I mentioned in my talk, the airfoil on that latest Boeing transport is a super critical airfoil, whether they admit it or not. <laughs> Well, if no other questions, and we've kept you for a long time, and, and uh, it has just been, I think, a fantastic afternoon. How about a <laughs> Can't tell how much we appreciate it. It's just been, I think, an incredible experience for all of us, and a real honor to have you here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. We couldn't have military airplanes with that amount of power, they just burned, they wouldn't have any range. So uh, that was the start of the whole idea, of everything going through the speed of sound, though. Now, the uh, 
In order to get through the speed of sound, we had to have something to cut way down on that drag due to the shock waves. The first uh, idea that was used, well, one of the first ideas, is to make a wing much thinner. That's a straightforward approach because then the air doesn't have to speed up as much around the airfoil and it, it doesn't, the shock waves don't get as strong. But uh, there's another thing that came along. The Germans, uh, particularly Bussmann, had invented Sweepback back in 1934. Uh, Sweepback is a very powerful tool in delaying the onset of these shock waves on an airplane. And so uh, at the end of World War II, along with a jet engine, the British, I mean the Germans were starting to build airplanes with swept back wings. So uh, anyway, that uh, is just uh, the development. Now we had the thinner wings, the sweep back, and putting them all together in another airplane would probably greatly reduce this uh, problem of the shock waves. And so uh, some of the first airplanes that we built, after World War II, we went into Germany and uh, we uh, went through all the papers and so forth that they had to see what they had knew they had that uh, was <coughs> that, uh, that would help on our, our airplanes, and that's where they found out how, what the Germans were doing with wing sweep back, and they came back to this country and immediately, airplane many airplanes that we were built were getting ready to build were in, changed to put sweep back in the wings. We already knew we could improve things with thinner wings. So uh, we, we had uh, various uh, tools or means of reducing the drag. At about that same time, after World War II, the, uh, the Pratt & Whitney Company developed the JFIN and started going to jets. Then the problem really got severe because the jets were going at faster speeds the, dry, the shock waves got stronger, and everything, well, uh, we had a, our tunnel to make tests on the things. But the British didn't have any wind tunnels at these speeds. And so they were decided that they'd go out and fly airplanes at these speeds. And they killed one pilot after another because the airplanes went out of control. It, the, the, this speed range is called the sonic barrier that nobody could ever get through it was going to be so bad. Now that's ridiculous. Bullets go through the speed of sound all the time. Uh, so uh, anyway, we faced up to it and we were, and when I walked in there, they were testing uh, propeller driven airplanes in dives. The P-38, had, a, which was a World War II airplane, had terrible problems when it got into a dive. And we, the people at the group where I was, uh, had just joined came up with a solution for that. I had nothing to do with it. I was just a young uh, helper at that point. Uh, but uh, so uh, this was the start of this whole problem of transonic flow due to the problems due to shock waves. <coughs> now, here at Langley, John Stack and at uh, the Air Force, they decided that what they wanted to do is to fly not like the British did, but this time they're going to do it carefully. They were going to build an airplane that could fly through the speed of sound, the X-1. And uh, Chuck Yeager, of course, did that flying and uh, became very famous for it because there were people, remember this was, the old wives tale was that you were going to get creamed when you went through the speed of sound because the British had gotten creamed. Uh, well, anyway, he went through the speed of sound very nicely, but his airplane was a rocket-propelled uh, well, airplane. It, was, it used up fuel at a fantastic rate. He could only fly five minutes at that speed, and he was out of fuel. It was not the way to go. It was a brute force approach to flying through the speed of sound. 57 <laughs> engine, a very, very powerful jet engine, much more powerful than anything that had come before. And so the military decided, the Air Force decided that they, what they could do was to build a 
start building supersonic military airplanes with a, the new jet engine and with these various ideas that had come up to uh, produce drag. But uh, they, there, there was a problem. We didn't have any means for accurately measuring what the data was, the, what was going on. So um, we, at the, at, the, at the group that I worked at, the transonic, it wasn't called transonic, it was called speed, high speed tunnel section. The, uh, we had to have a way of studying the flow about these configurations to see what we could do. And we, uh, we at the group developed the transonic wind tunnel. Uh, now, let's see, could I have the first slide, please? Now, the way that we do, the, got transonic speeds in the tunnel was to, we called it ventilating. We put slots in the tunnel walls. Uh, I was involved with this. I was not the basic inventor of the idea, but I worked on trying to <laughs> reduce the power required. And this is a sting-mounted model in the middle of the tunnel. And uh, that is the first, what we call, transonic tunnel. And we got data through the speed of sound a very, very important development, because up to that point, we didn't have a lot of good data on this problem. Now, with that, we could have the next slide, please. I mentioned something about the shock waves. And one of the tools that we had in that new tunnel was Schlieren. A Schlieren system is something that makes shock waves visible. You can see all the shock waves produced by this thing. This is at a supersonic speed because that's where the pictures are the best. Uh, when we, uh, <laughs> you, I think it gets complicated, but the tunnel, the Schlieren system for the tran tran transonic tunnel was not very good. Uh, it wasn't that it was the Schlieren was wrong, it was just that it was too small for the extent of the shock waves. Anyway, so we, this is something at a higher Mach number. This is about Mach number 1.4. That is 40% higher than the speed of sound. But I, wa I want this picture to show you how we could see the shock waves with the Schlieren system. Now, that's one of the things we used. We, we wanted to go into the new tunnel and study what the devil is going on because the uh, first test we ran on uh, the uh, military airplanes indicated that the drags were much higher than what they'd expected. Something bad was going on. And so, uh, can I have the next slide, please? I studied a, a made a study of a, the uh, flow around the representative airplanes and uh, I came up with, and we uh, used the Schlieren system I just described. And here is a picture of a uh, swept back wing on a fuselage. And that's a plan side view. And this is a, well, wait a minute, plan view, pardon me. And this is a side view. And don't, don't that's a scratch across there. <laughs> now, the uh, interesting thing is that Instead of having a strong shock wave here along the wing, there's a very strong normal shock wave here. This is a very weak wave. And uh, this is the side view, and it shows that the, 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 this, this wave doesn't even show up in that side view. Only the very strong normal wave. And I looked at it and I said, my God, that looks about like a shock pattern on a, a shock on a body of revolution uh, without the, uh, uh, all the uh, detailed effects of the swept bang wing. So there was the, the clues. Uh, I sat and thought about it and I boost um, It's my great pleasure and, and honor to uh, have the opportunity to introduce Truly, really one of the giants in the aeronautics in the past hundred years. There's not a person in this room who doesn't know all about Dr. Wilkins' accomplishments. Um, 
just briefly, he graduated, and correct me if I make a mistake here, but All right. uh, he correct uh, he graduated from uh, Worcester Polytechnic in 1943 and came right to Langley, worked in the train sound aerodynamics branch, I believe, for your entire career, is that correct? Yeah, well, there was, yeah, it was in the branch, but there were two different wind tunnels involved. All right, so yeah. the, the that particular branch retired in 1980 after 37 years of working here. Uh, we all know Dr. Wickham uh, discovered the concept of area ruling. Uh, he was awarded the Collier Trophy in 1954 for that. Um, also invented the um, application of supercritical wings to uh, aircraft and winglets, and was awarded numerous awards and prizes for those um, substantial contributions to our craft. Um, truly, we are fortunate, all of us in this room, standing on the shoulders of giants like Dr. Whitcomb. So without taking any more of his time, I'd like to, um, like to all extend a warm welcome to Dr. Richard Whitcomb. stand for this. Uh, <clears throat> well, when I first went to work at Langley, uh, back, this was during World War II, and uh, at that point we were beginning to get some of, see some of the problems involved with transonic aerodynamics. In particular, most of those problems were due to shock, onset of shock waves. And I'm going to get very basic. A shock whip is a very sudden increase in pressure that is, results from the air slowing down at transonic and supersonic speeds. It, uh, it's the thing that you hear when you hear a sonic boom. There's an awful lot of energy loss in a shock wave, which then results in drag. And of course, it also greatly disturbs the flow around the models or around airplanes so that it makes the airplanes very unstable at times. It was the problem of these, as we went left through airplanes of World War II 